Hi, Nick Davis here again and this time we're going to have a brief look at sections 2 and 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. Now this is a pretty important as well as highly useful and often unfairly maligned piece of legislation and it's essential to have an understanding of it. Although there has been some legislation which has come in recently which removes the requirement of certain self-employed people to be covered by this Act where their activities do not affect others, the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 still very much applies where there is a risk to both employees, including self-employed persons and others, and this would include people who work in frontline roles where there might be a need to use reasonable force such as physical intervention skills. So let's see what this is all about. So the first section we're going to look at is section 2 brackets 1 of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, which states the following. It shall be the duty of every employer to ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, the health, safety and welfare at work of all his employees. Now by the use of the word shall, the framers of the legislation are effectively saying that employees must ensure the health and safety of his or her employees. In other words, this is the employee's duty of care, which is an absolute. So there are no ifs or buts about this. So if you are an employer and you have employees, then you must ensure the health and safety of your employees as far as reasonably practicable. And what reasonably practical means is that if it is reasonable that the action can be taken, then it must be done. So this effectively comes down to something known as risk versus cost. So if the risk of not doing something is higher than the cost of taking the action to reduce the risk, then it is reasonably practicable to take the action despite the cost, and this must be done. However, if nothing is done, and the risk is ignored, then if something happens down the line where an employee is injured or worse, killed, then there will be a breach of this section which will re result in the employer committing an offence. Now this is something we'll perhaps be covering in more depth in a later video. So as an example, let's look at a fairly simple scenario of a security firm which supplies door supervisors to a venue. Due to staff shortages, the door supervisors are often left working an area on their own which in itself is a loan working issue. Um, let's assume therefore, as a result of the risk assessment, it is identified that one of the ways of reducing the risk to a more acceptable level is to issue the staff with personal radios. However, the management decide, for reasons of cost, that this is an action they're not willing to take, despite the risk. Then subsequently, a member of staff is seriously assaulted as a result of being unab unable to call for assistance. As a result of this, the company would therefore be in breach of section 2, brackets 1, because it was reasonably practicable to buy and issue personal radios. So you see how it works. Okay, so let's look at section 3, brackets 1, which says the following. It shall be the duty of every employer to conduct his undertaking in such a way as to ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, that persons not in his employment, who may be affected thereby, and not thereby exposed to risks to the health or safety. Again note the use of the word shall. This means they must do it. And what this section is covering is the duty of care the employer has to everyone else not in his or her employment. This therefore covers everyone from customers, service users, members of the public, visitors to the premises, uh, contractors etc etc. So. If this was a school, for example, this would cover the head teacher and senior management team's duty of care to not just the pupils who attend the school, but parents on the premises, visitors, contractors, etc, etc. In fact, just about anyone who comes into contact with the school through the course of its business. School staff, however, would be covered by Section 2. Again, the same requirement is made so far as reasonably practicable. So if you use an example of a school commissioning positive intervention training for its staff, in order that they may safely exercise their rights to use reasonable force under educational legislation, again this might be something else we'll cover in a later video, then the senior management in the school has a duty of care as far as reasonably pr practicable to ensure that the training given is appropriate and safe, and not just for the staff in line with section 2 brackets 1, but also for the service users, i.e. the pupils or others when staff have to use force as a last resort, in line with section 3 brackets 1. So really that's about it for sections 2 and 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. If you have any questions about this video or any of the subjects covered in the other videos here then you're very welcome to contact me on mail at nicholasdavis.com and I'll try and answer them as best as I can. Again I say thank you very much for listening and I'll see you in the next video.